Join me in Luke chapter 2. It's good to see Matt's parents here this morning. They love us so much that they drove all the way from, well, flew all the way from Washington State uh, to be here with us this morning. I think they told Matt they were here to see him, but we all know. We all know they were here to see me. So, anyway, <laughs> great to have you. Also, uh, I'll give a Shout out to all of our online community. Uh, it's actually pretty big. Uh, they, they watch from Washington State uh, almost every Sunday. And uh, we also have a group of people that are watching from uh, South Carolina, my mom and her friends. We have uh, some nurses up in Chesapeake that watch on a regular basis. And uh, anyway, it's just really cool to know that you know, God uses this little church to reach so many people. And uh, it's a, really a, a miracle of technology that we're able to take the gospel to places um, that otherwise maybe wouldn't get the gospel. So uh, just a blessing to have that capability. And I just want to thank all the people in the back that make all of that possible for us uh, each week. We're in the middle of a series. Well, at the end of a series. Oh, my. Wow. We're all the way to the end. End of a series, moments that matter. We're talking about the birth of Jesus and all the moments that surround the birth of Jesus. We're looking at the people and the decisions they had to make, and we're hopefully asking ourselves, would I make the same decision if I was in the same situation? If God asked me to go, if he asked me to speak or not to speak, would I make the choice that he wants me to make, or would I let that moment pass me by? Father, we pray this morning that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would speak from your word to our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for those that are watching online. I pray your blessings upon them. Lord, I also know there are some that are watching because of physical ailments. They're not able to be here with us and others who are going through very difficult times in their lives right now and, Lord, just can't come to church. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can take church to them. Lord, I pray that you would meet them where they're at, that you would wrap your loving arms around them, that you would lift them up and support them and give them every single thing that they need to get through this difficult season of their lives. Lord, I pray that today, as you speak through your word, that you would shape us and mold us into people that would be obedient when we're faced with moments that matter. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. My bus used to drop me off at a cut above beauty salon uh, after school when I was in an elementary school. And you might say, well, that sounds kind of bad. You know, you have to get dropped off at a beauty salon every day. And I would say, you're absolutely wrong about that. Because there is nothing more entertaining than being in a beauty salon and listening to these women gossip about your entire community. Um, they, here's what would happen. They would put these Darth Vader helmets on. I, I don't know what those things were actually for. I think they were hair dryers, something to do with the perm. I don't know. They were very loud, right? So the, the helmet was loud, so the people that wanted to talk to each other had to be even louder than the helmet. So <laughs> setting in this shop, I learned a lot about the things that were going on in my community. I was in third grade, and so I would go to the playground, and I would share this information <laughs> with my friends. I was Twitter before Twitter, right? I was the information superhighway for all third graders. So we'd gather under the jungle gym. I'd be like, hey, hey, you know, you know Luke? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, we got to hang out with Luke this year. And they're like, why? 
I'm like, because he's going to get two Christmases. His parents got divorced and his mom remarried. And so now he's going to have two Christmases. Can you imagine the toys? They're like, yes, where's Luke? We got to be best friends. And then I, I, I would tell him, I'd be like, you know, you know Han? He'd be like, yeah. You know that new bike he's riding? Yeah, yeah, we saw his bike. But guess what? His dad had to buy him that because his dad skipped his recital to go golfing. And his mom got mad and made him buy him a bike. Yeah. Now, it, it, I remember this one very specifically. So I, I was like, you know, you know Leia? They're like, yeah, yeah, we know Leia. I'm like, you know her dad owns a business? Well, guess what? His business went under. They're like, oh, man. And I'm like, they sold the building. And they're like, dude. I'm like, Chuck E. Cheese, yeah. We're getting a Chuck E. Cheese in Scott Depot, West Virginia. And I was like the hero of all the third graders. But the thing I remember most about that beauty salon is that, that, that my mom worked there. And like everybody that sat in her chair, she talked to them about Jesus. It didn't matter who they were, how old they were, how young they were. She would talk to every single person about Jesus. I guess she had a captive audience, you know. Uh, I remember it was kind of like a scene from The Godfather. There was this dude in her chair, and she's got this straight razor out, and she's, she's shaving him. She's like, so where do you go to church? <laughs> and if he said nowhere, she'd be like, we're having revival on Tuesday night, and I'd hate for something to happen to you before revival on Tuesday night, so maybe you should be there. He's like, yes, ma'am, I'll be there. I, she got it honest. Her mom and dad were uh, both people that loved to talk about Jesus. Uh, her dad, my grandfather, was a, a Baptist minister. And before he died, God gave him this gift of prophecy. And so he was on his deathbed in his house, and we would all go in one at a time, and he would kind of prophesy over whoever would walk into the room. And I remember I was really young, but I walked in there, and I started talking to him. And uh, he, he started to prophesy over me, and he said, life is like fishing. And then he said, you, you don't catch a fish every cast. That's why you have to keep casting. And of course, at that time, I thought he was talking about real fishing. So I'm like, all right, good advice. Keep casting. Got it. Later on, I understood what he meant. He was talking about Jesus. He was talking about evangelism. He was letting me know that, hey, they, they might not respond every time you talk about Jesus, but that doesn't mean you stop talking about Jesus. So I inherited a, a passion for talking about Jesus from my parents who inherited a passion from talking about Jesus from their parents. And so everything I've ever done in my life has been built on the backbone of me talking about Jesus. I never knew that was a thing, though. It, like, never registered to me that I shouldn't talk about Jesus. Like, that's just how life is, you know? You want more people to know about Jesus. Until about 13 years ago, I hosted an event and it was kind of like a warp tour for Christians. We brought in bands and uh, like BMX riders and all these Christian people came to this parking lot. And uh, we invited all the youth groups in the, in the region and they showed up and we had a great time. But I remember specifically at that event, there were these teenagers that showed up and one of them was, you know, he had like, he had dreads and he had a, a marijuana shirt on and they kind of stayed off to the side a little bit. So I noticed them. I was glad they were there. And then I noticed this 70-year-old woman who was one of my volunteers. I didn't know her. She just showed up to help. And I noticed that she noticed them. <laughs> and I saw her making a beeline for this boy in the marijuana t-shirt. And I was like, this is not going to go well. So I tried to get there, and I couldn't because somebody stopped me and needed to talk to me. So this lady beats me to this kid, and I'm watching from a distance, and I see her say something to him, and he looks like this. And then she grabs this teenage boy by the wrist and starts to drag him through the crowd. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, she's going to kill him. I don't know what's going So I, I told this person, I'm like, I have to go, and I'm running to try to catch up to him, but I'm too late. She gets to the, where the, the ramp is, where the BMX guys are doing their stunts and stuff, and she starts pushing through the crowd, brings him up to the very front, and pushes this kid aside and gives him a seat right beside the ramp. And by the time I get there, I hear her say, I'm so glad you're here. I know you couldn't see good over there, so I want you to sit right here. And then she walks off. I'm like, wow, that's incredible. So then the BMX guys, they get done with their little stunt show, 
And one of them starts to share his testimony. And he talks about how he was addicted to drugs and all this other stuff and how he met Jesus and Jesus changed his life. And now he just wants to talk about Jesus. Then they do this invitation. And uh, they, they, they kind of say, hey, if you want to you know, learn more about Jesus, stand up. And this kid was the first kid to stand up. And that whole crowd, he pops right out of his chair and he goes to this tent and he learns about Jesus and he gives his life to Jesus and he gets connected with the church. And so I am on cloud nine because I'm the host of this event. I'm like, this is the whole point of it. You know, this is why we do what we do so lives can be changed. I was just so excited. And then I went to church on Wednesday. (laughs) We had youth group and some parents came up to me and they said, great event. And I was like, thank you. And then they were like, um, but when are we going to get back to doing stuff for us? I'm like, us? And they're like, you know, us. And I'm like, oh, us. Who's us? <laughs> I was very confused. They're like, us. And then I realized what they were talking about. See, in their mind, there was a, an us, the Christians, and there was a them, the non-Christians. And they're right. Biblically speaking... There is an us, the Christians, and there is a them, the non-Christians. But do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says the gospel is not just for us. Literally, everything that we do is for them. In the New Testament, once the church was established, the Bible says that we gather together to encourage one another for what? For good, good works. We gather and we go. We gather together, we learn about Jesus, we worship Jesus, we get full of the Spirit, we encourage one another, we meet each other's needs, and then we go. Jesus himself gave us a command. He says, go unto all of the world and make disciples. That wasn't just for the apostles, that was for every Christian who would ever live. That is our mission statement. Even the passages of scripture where it talks about how we should love one another. Jesus says, love one another so they will know what? That you are my disciples. Literally, the love that we show each other is designed not for us, but for them so they can know the Lord. Now, here's the sad part. (coughs) Statistics say that the longer you are in church, the less likely you are to talk about Jesus, like evangelism, outside the walls of the church. The longer you're in church, the less likely you are to share Jesus outside the church. Like, what? <laughs> that, that, that can't be. That shouldn't. Think about Paul. The apostle Paul, he, he said, pray for me so that I might have boldness. To share the gospel. In the scriptures, they lay hands on people for healing, and they also lay hands and pray for people commissioning. Commissioning them to do what? Commissioning them to go outside the walls of the church and share the good news of Jesus with other people. There are more prayers in the New Testament asking for boldness than there are prayers asking for healing. God is trying to tell us something. And my theory is I just think it becomes easier and easier as the years go by to focus on programs and events that pacify us. It's just easier. I mean, do I like talking about Jesus? Well, yes and no. (laughs) No, because I don't like rejection and I don't like embarrassment and I don't really like awkward conversations. But yes, because I've experienced the love of Jesus, and I want others to experience that same love. There's there's spiritual war that is taking place that makes it hard for us to want to share the gospel. We have to recognize that the enemy wants to put a wall between us and them so that we don't share the gospel. And he will play on our insecurities and whatever he has to do in order to get us to miss our moment, our opportunity to share Jesus with others. But that's why Acts chapter 1, verse 8 is so important. Jesus says, my power will come upon you so that you can be my, my witnesses. 
Why does Jesus give us the power of the Holy Spirit? In part, so we can have the power to be witnesses because it's hard to be witnesses. We don't naturally want to be witnesses, but with the power of Jesus, the wind in our sails, we can be witnesses for Jesus. So my kind of sticky statement for this sermon is, you never know what God might do with one moment of boldness. You never know what God might do with one moment of boldness. So let's get to the scripture. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. I promised you some quality shepherd content this week, and I plan to deliver. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Who's it for? All the people. people. Joy that is for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This angel shows up after 400 years of silence, and Malachi was the last prophet 400 years before this, and his closing statement was basically that God would come and he would gather his children. He would turn their hearts back to them. And so that day is finally here. And here's the crazy part. The angel of the Lord skipped over all of the elite, all of the religious leaders, and went straight to these shepherds. The angel announces the birth of Jesus to shepherds. Ordinary outcasts. So here's the stuff that shepherds had to deal with. First of all, they were not allowed to testify in court. So let's go back to that beauty salon, cut above, Scott Depot, West Virginia. Ladies with the hair dryers. Imagine what they were saying about the shepherds. You can't trust a shepherd. They're going to lie to your face. They stay outside most of the time. They have holes in their jeans and tattoos on their arms, and they they hang out with animals more than people. You can't trust a shepherd. That's what the entire community was saying about these guys. They, They rarely sold anything. You know why? Well, if they had something to sell you, they probably stole it. So you don't want to buy from a shepherd. True story. They were ceremonially unclean. They weren't allowed to go to church. Can you believe that Chewbacca would (laughs) invite the shepherds to church? Doesn't he know they're unclean? There's no room for them in the church. (laughs) That was good. (laughs) They were social outcasts. They were bottom-rung people. They were the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the shepherds, and the dung sweepers, which when I was doing my research, I I didn't know what a dung sweeper was, but that was actually a a, a job in this society that was very much looked down upon. It was pretty much the, the lowest form of work that you could get. By the way, remember who Jesus got in trouble for hanging out with? All the above. Tax collectors, prostitutes, dung sweepers, shepherds. See, God sent his heavenly hosts out of all the people on the planet to talk to the shepherds first. The shepherds were the first people besides Mary and Joseph to know that the Savior of the world was born. And what did they do? It says they immediately go to Bethlehem and check it out. Look at verse 16. It says they, that's the shepherds, they hurried off immediately and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was in the manger. No hesitation. I don't know about you, but for me, it's easy to hesitate in those moments that that matter. When, When God opens the door for me to have the Jesus conversation, that my natural tendency, unfortunately, is to hesitate. And sometimes I hesitate so long that the door shuts and the moment has passed me by. I love these shepherds because they did not hesitate. They went urgently to Jesus. 
So what we have to do is we have to replace hesitation with urgency. Urgency says, I can't stand to keep this news to myself. I got to tell somebody. We, we have this event coming up. It's on the 28th of this uh, January, January 28th, 5 o'clock here at the church in the Fellowship Center. One of our goals this year is we want to give you more opportunities to invite people to church. And we understand that sometimes when you invite people to church on a Sunday morning, it's either really crowded or perhaps it's a, a really big commitment. People think if they come once, they have to come lots of times. So every month, one time per month, we're going to have an awesome worship service in the Fellowship Center with great music, great message. There'll be people, there'll be young people there, teenagers there. It'll be, everybody will be there. So we're giving you an opportunity to be like the shepherds and to, to invite people urgently to come meet Jesus. Because that's what urgency is. Urgency is when you see every interaction as a chance for action. See, these shepherds, they, they met Jesus, and then what did they do? Well, it says they, they waited four years to get their seminary degree, and then they started inviting people to church, right? Some of you think that's true. That's funny. Um, no, that's not what happened. It says they met Jesus, and then they immediately went and told people about him. Chapter 2, verse 17. After seeing them, they reported the message that they were told about this child. The shepherds told everyone. And I find it so fascinating that the first people to learn about the birth of Jesus were shepherds who, in that culture, really were no account type of people. And the first people to learn about the resurrection of Jesus were women who, in that culture at that time, were basically no account type of people. Now, there's not a lot written about this, and so I outsourced it. I, I sent to my worship team, sent a text out, and I'm like, why do you think that is? Why did God choose to announce the birth of Jesus to the shepherds and the resurrection of Jesus to women when neither group was actually able to be able to give an account to, to testify? Jonah said, it's easier for the gospel to speak for itself. Nothing fancy. A doctor for the sick and good news to the poor. Pretty wise guy, right? Good job, Jonah. I liked Lynn's. She said, it falls into the place with humility. Shepherds and women, given their status in that culture, would have no reason to exaggerate the story. This is your worship team, folks. They're, they're really smart. I asked my wife. She said, and I quote, because women would actually listen. <laughs> I'm like, what'd you say? She's like, I said what I said and walked off. Here's my opinion. Let's say that if there was a survey of your friends, people would pick you to be the least likely person that they know to share the gospel or to talk about Jesus with anybody. Let's say that that's you. What I want you to know today is if that's you, that's actually really, really good news because people will be more likely to listen to you than they will me. Because when I tell people about Jesus, they say, well, you have to do that. That's your job. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's my calling, not my job, but whatever. Then the, the more uh, glass half empty type of people, I guess, they would say, well, PK is just trying to get more people into his congregation. So that's why he's talking about Jesus. But when the shepherds speak, they have nothing to gain. They're the least likely people on the planet to be talking about Jesus. They have nothing to gain except for you to have your life be better based on the information they just shared with you. When shepherds talk, people listen. When you talk as the least likely person in your family to share Jesus, people will listen. Look at verse 18. All who heard it were what? They were amazed. Why were they amazed? Because the shepherds were the ones bringing the good news. God chose to speak through the shepherds. Friends, this is a reminder that we do not need to allow the devil to play on our insecurities. Some of us are like, I'm not going to talk about Jesus because I don't know enough. Some people are like, I don't want to talk about Jesus because people will think I'm weird. Others will say, I don't want to talk about Jesus because people will find me annoying. You know what's annoying? Having the greatest news in the history of the world and keeping it to yourself. That, friends is annoying. This is good news for everyone. 
John Piper once said, the gospel is like a lion. You don't need to defend the lion. You just let the lion out of its cage. It's good news for everybody, for your hunting buddies, for your teammates, for your your teachers, for your neighbors, for kings and queens, for dung sweepers and prostitutes and tax collectors and shepherds and people like me, you know? It's good news for everyone. Think about it this way. A lot of people struggle with the guilt associated with their poor decisions. We would call that sin. And Jesus says, you're forgiven, right? So when they talk about that, you say, look, I know a guy (laughs) who can get rid of all that for you. People want purpose and meaning and fulfillment and love in their life. And Jesus is like, come on, (laughs) I got all that for you. People want strength and power and success. What does the Bible promise through the Holy Spirit? We can have all of those things. There are folks out there that are like, I actually want to know God, and I want to be known by God. Good news. You can because of Jesus. There are people out there that are understanding that evolution is so far-fetched. It's absolutely unbelievable to think that all of this happened by random coincidence, and they're looking at all of the the creation, the the design that's in the world, and they're saying, well, that can't be true. So, so if there's a design, there must be a creator. And who is that creator? Hey, guess what? I know a guy named Jesus, and he can tell you all about it. This is good news. Some people, they say to me, well, I feel like there's more to life than this. Like, yeah, you're right. Let me tell you about Jesus. It's good news. Friends, I, I could not wait to get to that playground in third grade, go under that jungle gym, and tell all my friends the good news that Chuck E. Cheese was coming to Scott Depot, West Virginia. By the way, they all hated me because Chuck E. Cheese never came to Scott Depot, (laughs) West Virginia. Those ladies under the hairdryer, as usual, were wrong about what they were talking about. We got one 30 minutes away, but not one in our own backyard. But the point is, I could not wait to share the good news that I had heard. And these shepherds could not wait to tell people the good news of Jesus. I want you to hear Romans chapter 9. Verse 1, this is a a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. Just listen to these, these first words. Listen to how he has to start this conversation with the church. He says, I speak the truth in Christ... I am not lying. (laughs) My conscience testifies to me through the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and an unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. He has to say that he's not lying because everybody that read that would be like, there's no way that you can care about them that much. That's not just Paul. That's the power of the Holy Spirit working in Paul, the same power that you and I have. His heart for the lost is the same heart that we should have for the lost. Like that's supposed to be our default setting. We gather here to learn about Jesus and to to pray with one another and to sing praise songs and and, and to, to lift one another up and encourage each other for good works and when one of us is sad, we cry. And when one of us is happy, we, we celebrate together. That's what the church is all about. But there are so many churches out there where people just gather to gossip. Or they gather to critique the sermons or critique the worship songs. And there, there's some churches where people just gather to, to check, went to church, off the to-do list for the week. That's not why we're here. Francis Chan said, Those who argue for the existence of judgment live least like it exists. That's not who we are. We're dry bones that were brought to life. By the way, encounter on the 28th, that's what we're going to talk about. We are dry bones that were brought to life. We were literally dead in our sin and trespass, but through the power of Jesus and our faith in him, we have been brought to life. We had a death sentence, then we got pardoned, and now we get to live an eternal life in heaven with God forever. That's good news. (laughs) That's the heart of the church. 
And the shepherds, they, they shared that message with urgency. And now they are famous for it. We are still singing songs about these shepherds. Go tell it on the mountain over the... Yeah, right? Well, I know that song. Maybe you don't. It's about the shepherds. Because <laughs> when they heard about Jesus, they went and they told it on the mountain and on fields and everywhere. They're like, look, the virgin gave birth and, and she had a son and he was born in Bethlehem, just like the prophecy said, and his name is Jesus. And they, they said that means Emmanuel, which means God with us. And the reason he was born is to save the world from its sins. They're like, no one is too far from God's reach. No one is too messed up for God's love. No sin is too great for God's grace. They're like, don't let this moment pass us by. Have the gospel conversation. And we should too. I had a seminary professor one time put it to me like this. He said, every time that you fail to have the conversation about Jesus, you are saying no to Jesus on behalf of that person. Think about that. When we fail to have the gospel conversation, we are saying no to Jesus on behalf of that person. Don't hesitate. Don't let the moment pass you by. Because you never know what God might do with one moment of boldness. The shepherd said, the Savior is here. And so the first thing that we have to do is we have to, save that, we have to say that to ourselves. The Savior is here. You got to tell your depression and tell your anxiety that the Savior is here. You got to tell your financial problems that the Savior is is here. You got to tell your addictions that the Savior is here. You got to tell your guilt and your shame and your sorrows that a Savior is here. That's for us. But the gospel doesn't just belong to us, it also belongs to them. So we say it to ourselves and then we say it to others. Friends, don't give up on that person that you love. God never gave up on you, so don't give up on them. Tell them about Jesus, because you never know what God might do with one moment of boldness. Father, thank you for those who have gathered here to worship and those that are watching. Lord, and I thank you that I serve in a, a church that has a heart for the lost. Lord, I, I don't see many walls being built around here to keep people away from the gospel, so I thank you for that, but I also know that we're just one in many, and so... Lord, first of all, I just pray that we never fall into that temptation to make church all about us. And also, Lord, I, I pray that you would be with other churches in our community. And if any of them are struggling with that issue of making the church all about them, Lord, I pray that they would see the heart of the gospel for what it truly is and that we would all take on the, the personality characteristics of the shepherds that we would see what we have received as good news that's changed our life, that's brought us from death into life, and that we could then urgently take that message to the community around us. Lord, you give us six days every week where we can invite somebody to church. I pray that we would take advantage of those. Lord, you've placed people in our hearts and our minds that we love, and we want them to know Jesus. And sometimes the temptation is, for me at least, to kind of give up. After years go by and there's been no movement, we just kind of move on. And Lord, help us to never get to that place. Help us to have the heart of the shepherds. Help us to constantly, daily, just seek you through prayer and ask you to relieve those people of the, the chains that are on their soul and the, the blinders that are on the, their eyes. Lord, help them to see the goodness of Jesus and help us to communicate it well. Lord, I thank you for what you've done in this past year. It's been an extremely challenging year for me and for so many of my, my friends and my brothers and sisters in Christ. But Lord, as I reflect back on this last day of the year, I, I just see you showing up over and over again. Not just spiritually, Lord, but when the friends would come to visit, when someone would bring some food to the house, when I get a text or a phone call or a letter and I'd come to church and someone would just wrap their arms around me and pray over me, my family. 
Lord, as we just sang those worship songs together, it just seemed like the, the worship team would always pick the right song for me that week, the thing that I needed to, to lift me up and help me do what you've called me to do. So I thank you for all of that, Lord, and even the things that I haven't even acknowledged or didn't even see that, that just happens, Lord, I, I thank you. You've been there with me, and I know you've been there with my brothers and sisters as well. So as we look forward to next year, 2024, I pray, Lord, that you would really place on our hearts a, a desire to be your witnesses in our version of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. I pray that you'd fill us with your spirit, that you'd protect us from the schemes of the evil one, and that you would draw more people into yourself, that we would see salvations and baptisms, and that you would allow us to be part of the ministry. So Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for everything you've done, everything you're going to do. Help us to sing praises to you in this moment from the depths of our soul, out of gratitude for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray.